Wow, what a great story. I'm sure you learned a lot of new words you've never heard before, so let's go over them. I'm going to read definitions in a different order because I think some definitions will help you understand other words. Let's start with physics. Physics, from the Greek word physica, which means natural things, is the study of matter and energy. What exactly is matter? Why does matter act the way it does? How is energy created? Can we control energy? How are matter and energy related? And how do they work together? These are some of the many questions that physicists try to answer. Basically, why does matter matter? <laughs> now on to Adam. Everything around you, including you, your house, earth, the sun, is made of atoms. They are the smallest bits of elements, such as hydrogen and carbon, that still hold the characteristics of an element. We borrowed the word atomos, which means indivisible, from the Greek language. And what they mean by indivisible is that something cannot be broken apart into smaller pieces. So take this piece of paper, for example. Right now, I can rip it apart into smaller pieces. So it's divisible. But if I'm patient enough and keep ripping it apart, eventually the paper will reach a point where it cannot be broken apart into smaller pieces. It will become indivisible. Now, people used to think that an atom was the tiniest bit of matter you could get if you kept cutting something into smaller and smaller pieces. It is, but now we know that is not true. As tiny as an atom is, it is made up of even tinier parts, neutrons, protons, and electrons. So let's go over to neutron. Of the three parts that make up an atom, the neutron is the only one with no electric charge. Neutrons are found inside the nucleus of an atom and combined with protons make up an element's atomic mass or weight. So if you go here, the green circles represent neutrons. And you can see they live inside the nucleus. And the nucleus is shown by this dark circle on outline right here. Now over to proton, the last of the three parts that make up an atom, protons can be found inside the nucleus with the neutrons. With a positive electric charge, a proton usually cancels out the negative electric charge of an electron in the same atom. The number of protons in an element is what gives the element its number on the periodic table. Okay, now to electron over here, one of the three components of an atom, electrons are the only parts not inside the nucleus. Instead, they orbit the nucleus like a cloud of moths around a porch light. Electrons have a negative electric charge. So we had gone over protons, which are red here, and they live inside the nucleus. But then the electrons, which are the yellow circles, live outside of the nucleus, and they travel along this circular path right here. Now that you understand neutron, proton, and electron, you can now understand nucleon. A nucleon can be a proton or a neutron, either of the individual components of an atom's nucleus. So what that's saying is that protons and neutrons can also be called by a different name and that is nucleon. Nucleons live in the nucleus. Since protons and neutrons live in the nucleus, they can also be named nucleons. Now let's go over to positron. A positron is the antiparticle of an electron, sort of like the electron's opposite evil twin, except that it's not evil. Neutrino. Not usually part of atoms, neutrinos can come out of atoms during beta decay. Neutrinos, like neutrons, have no electric charge and are almost massless. Their name is Italian for little neutrons because they are like tiny neutrons. They can also travel at or near the speed of light. Nothing else travels that fast besides photons, also known as light particles. Hmm, beta decay. What is that? Ah, here, beta decay. Also written as beta decay, so here is the Greek symbol for beta. 
Beta decay is basically what happens when a nucleon in an atom's nucleus or the center decays or breaks apart. If the nucleon was a neutron, then it becomes a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. This is known as beta minus decay. If the nucleon was a proton, then it breaks into a neutron, a positron, and a neutrino. This is beta plus decay. Now, parity. When physicists talk about parity, they talk about whether it is conserved or not. Parity is conserved when something and its mirror image react or respond in exactly the same way to outside influences. Parity is about how symmetrical a system is. Okay, that's a bit confusing. I get it. So imagine two particles in the shape of hands. The reason I say that is because your hands are mirror images of each other. Your left hand is the mirror image of your right hand, and your right hand is the mirror image of your left hand. And I'm talking about my left and my right. It looks opposite for you. But basically, imagine these hand-shaped particles, and if you and you put them in the same environment. So in the same conditions, if they react the same exact way in those conditions, then parity is conserved. They are symmetrical. But now let's say that the hand-shaped particles react differently in the same conditions. Then parity is not conserved. The system is not symmetrical. Hypothesis. In science, the word hypothesis means an idea someone has thought of after doing a bunch of calculations and using logical inference. This idea has not yet been tested. After the hypothesis has been thoroughly and carefully tested through a series of experiments, often by a number of different scientists, and all the results seem to confirm this idea, then the hypothesis becomes a scientific theory something that has credibility or something that is believable. So essentially what this definition is trying to tell us is that a hypothesis is what you think is going to happen in an experiment. So you go into your experiment and you see if your evidence confirm or do not confirm what you think is going to happen. Or in other words, you want to see if your data support or do not support your hypothesis what you think is going to happen. Now, element. A substance that can't be chemically separated into anything simpler. Some examples of common elements are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, gold, and silver. Hmm, cannot be separated into anything simpler. Where did we talk about something similar earlier? Ah, atom. Now it's time to be careful. An element is not exactly the same thing as an atom. Elements are made up of atoms, and each type of element is made up of a specific type of atom. So let me show you the difference right here. Here I show you two molecules. One is carbon dioxide, a gas that we breathe out, and here we have oxygen gas which we breathe in. Oof, I just threw a new word at you that was not included in the glossary. Molecule. What is a molecule? It is a group of atoms bonded together. So you see here, this red atom is bonded to this gray atom, and this gray atom is bonded to this red atom. Each different colored atom represent a specific type of atom and each type of atom corresponds to an element. So this red atom represents oxygen and this gray atom represents carbon. This molecule or group of atoms bonded together is made up of two elements, but it is made up of three atoms. Let me say that a different way. We have one type of atom, which is the element oxygen. 
and there are two of them. This atom represents the element carbon, and there is one of them. In the oxygen gas molecule, we see the element oxygen, and there are two atoms of the one element oxygen. Okay, congratulations, fifth graders. You know some physics now. You should be proud of yourselves. I'm proud of you.